suffragists say, happen what may, they'll win the coming fight. Twixt you and me, I don't agree, we're gonna show them who's right. Junk clothes they wear, cannot compare with the anti-suffrage rose. Token of love and a gift from above, loveliest flower that grows. Suffrage Rose, you're the flower that's best of all. You're better far than jungles are. We are going to prove it in the fall. Sweetest flower in all the world. Everybody knows you're the emblem of the anti suffrage cause. You lovely red, red. everybody, this is Karen Lambert, and I am here with Scarlett Hollingsworth. She is Scarlett from Charlotte, and Scarlett has been an exceptional person to me as far as um, not only being a friend, but someone who is very interested in women's rights, voting, and being involved in her community as an advocate. Hey, Karen, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I am Scarlett Voter. Hollingsworth, yes, voter is my maiden name. Uh, I am in Charlotte, North Carolina, so people know me as Scarlett from Charlotte. Uh, I have been engaged in activism very heavily uh, since the 2016 election, starting with um, becoming a, the, the Moms Demand Action Front. I am a group leader with Moms Demand Action in the uh, Charlotte area, and also, with, and I'm wearing my shirt for Indivisible District 9, we are a group of 1,200 strong uh, across the Charlotte area with support across the country. Uh, we are one of the groups of the indivisible, and we work to uh, elect progressive candidates, support uh, candidates that will, uh, you know, really listen to their constituents and, and move forward with that. So I am the communications manager for Indivisible District 9 in Charlotte as well. Very nice. Now, Scarlett is a friend of mine, and Scarlett came up here in October last year uh, to help me with my father's funeral because she is so well-versed at not only speaking to people, she became an ordained reverend, and uh, I had to invite her up, and she was nice enough to help me. So when she was here, though, she uh, informed me um, and this is going to really show some of my ignorance here to women's rights and voting and suffrage and all of that. But she was informing me that I was very close to where the, um, the whole women's suffrage movement began. And uh, there was very uh, many instrumental people in this area that helped get the vote voting right past. And it's just a wealth of history in this area. And I had no clue. Mm -hmm. So we went on a great tour. We started out with Susan B. Anthony's house and then uh, went over to Seneca Falls where the Women's Rights Center. Um, but we drove all around and we saw different historical uh, places and it was just really very mm -hmm. informative to me and I am thankful that she brought me down there. So now I can learn some more from Scarlett. So hey. Scarlett prepared this wonderful presentation that she's going to go over with us. And I, I think it's really important for young women, um, let alone any age woman out there, uh, for us to really know our history. And, you know, it really wasn't that long ago that we were given the rights. Mm -hmm. So a hundred years ago, we first had our right to vote, which, you know, in the big scheme of things, that's nothing. It's not that mm -hmm. far. No, it's so, not. Yeah, it's just, it's quite amazing the accomplishments that uh, women were able to achieve. Yes, and, and, the, and the partnership. You can see I have the imagery behind me from yeah. the Susan B. Anthony Park in Rochester, New York that you and I visited. And so here you've got Frederick Douglass, and then on this side you have Susan B. Anthony. 
So there was a strong partnership between the uh, abolitionists and the suffragists um, and what they had to do when they were fighting for, you know, uh, civil rights for all, uh, just on different fronts. And so there's a lot of history there. Uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, not, they kind of just intersect so, um, so strongly on um, just kind of advancing the country. Uh, so I was really glad to see that. And your watch, as you're right, was a hotbed for it. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, you know, I don't know, I'm sure we learned about it, but it just, it didn't stick with me. I wish the teachers maybe would have made it a little more exciting or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I'm going yeah. to blow your mind. Blow my mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I did put a lot of information about um, just the, the history going from 1776 to 1920. As you mentioned, we have had the right, uh, let me just kind of quantify that. We didn't, you know, we didn't, uh, we weren't given the right to vote. We had to fight right. for the right to vote, right? Um, so if you really think about the origins of the United States back in 1776 when Abigail Adams really spoke to you know, her husband when they were going and writing the Declaration of Independence and the famous phrase is to remember the ladies. I uh, don't really think that that stuck with her husband because men were written um, into the Declaration, not women. Right. So it's been a journey from there since the, uh, the origins of our country. Nice. Yeah. Um, so just thinking about where we were in the 1770s from the eight and then going on into the 1800s about women's place in the United States in our society and women were really think of the, um, you know, women were the hearth in the home right. and they were, you know, they were the mothers, they were the caretakers, they were the educators, they were the nurses right. um, that they did all that in the confines of the home. And so this time frame, just going back to, and I just give that to give some context to show um, where women were in their minds when they went to kind of went to this place of seeking suffrage. Mm -hmm. um, they really were just meant to be seen and not heard, right? Just basically do your job. And so they call this during that time, and I had not learned this term until just doing this research, the cult of domesticity. Oh, no. And I know personally that has never been a place that I have felt my calling to be at home and to be the cult of domesticity. No, that, that it, would have been torture, I'm sure, for our soul. <laughs> nor has it been my strength. All right. I know. No, I neither. All right. So during that time frame, one of the things, and when you were, when you and I were, we were talking a little bit about some of these things, and um, and I'm sure you've probably thought, and I'm sure other people might think, well, why New York? Um, and as we know, um, you know, New York, you know, they obviously they did not have slaves. Um, you know, they had New York had a lot of political action that was going on. I think mm -hmm. people that I think about um, the history of the country, New York was one of the four, four place forerunners of thought mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, movers and shakers within the country. Right. So one of one of the movers and shakers who was um, she was also a Quaker and Quakers, um, you know, were really more uh, about uh, social. They were well. There were some arguments that they might not have done enough. Um, and there was a later on there was a, a faction against um, the lack of action, if you will, on the Quakers front. But Lucretia Mott, and a lot of people might not have heard of her, right. but she was active on the anti-slavery society. So her one of her first forays into social justice was the anti-slavery movement, nice. and she was um, she actually um, was part of that, and she is one of the names that you'll hear all throughout this with the suffrage movement. So had you heard of Lucretia Mott? Before? I had not prior to you coming up. Yeah. Or so not, that, again, not that I remembered. I'm sure I probably did, but. Yeah, she's instrumental. Most people think Susan B. Anthony, right? They think right. she, and that's probably the only name they know, but right. there's so many yeah, more. Susan B. Anthony is definitely the name that you know in Frederick Douglass. Um, yeah. But I, nope, not Lucretia. Nope. Yep. So, so I kind of teased that in there so you can understand the how things kind of weave together. So, Lucretia Mott, because of her work with anti-slavery, um, she went to London to the World's Anti-Slavery Convention, 
And okay. who should she meet there but Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was with her husband, who was a major abolitionist, and they were on their honeymoon. Okay. So the women fought hard to be part of this, to be on the floor and be part of this as a delegate for the um, the women, the world's anti-slavery convention, and they were not allowed. And um, to coin a phrase, they were hot. They That's were the very- thing. Are they here in this image um, trying to fight to get in? Is that what's going on there? Mm -hmm. And they were not allowed to be a part of it. And needless to say, that lit a fire. All right, oh, I bet. Under both of them. Oh, I bet. All right. So along the same time, think about what women are doing in the world and in the, or in the country. Um, and in the Northeast, again, you have, you have more of the, the organizing going on. So around that same time that we have the abolitionists, then you have the labor reform that's going on. So one of the, the first female labor reform association um, was started in Massachusetts. And you can just see some things that it, it did for us. So this is just a major push forward for rights for workers, for women, for for a former slaves. Our work day. Mm -hmm. What was their work day? Uh, you know, that's a good good question. Could have been fourteen, sixteen hours. Gosh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Wow. I know. I know. Uh. So this is what I found so interesting. Um, so and if you look at the date, this is just really where it blows my mind. It also is my parents' anniversary, July 9th, so it's okay. kind of cool. So July 9th, 18, nine. yeah, no, right, another nine. Uh, July 8th, uh, excuse me, July 9th, 1848, mm -hmm. and thinking of the people that we just mentioned, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, mm -hmm. they were actually invited to come over to uh, Jane Hunt's home because they needed some, t they needed, I would just say, a safe place to vent, right? So in this conversation of a tea party, they let their, as, as you can see, it let them have their ability to air their grievances about their station in life as women. Right. What they are, yeah, what, what they're tasked to do how little they're given, how little time and attention that, you know, it's, it's basically just toil, right? So look at the day, excuse me, look at the, <laughs> look at the date on that. And then they got so incensed and so motivated. And this is, by the way, this is in upstate New York. So when you think about Seneca Falls and why right. Seneca Falls, right. this is because of where the women were living, right? Mm -hmm. So 10, Ten days later, if you'll go down to the next slide, in ten days <laughs> from that tea party, you have the first women's rights convention what in kind Seneca of Falls. People are there? Wow! So they put an ad in the newspaper. It just escalated from there, and it might not. They kind of threw it together, right. and they got quite an array of, of folks. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton is the major player in this. Okay. Um, oddly enough, Susan B. Anthony was not part of this first women's convention. Okay. This, that, they would not get together until 1850. Okay. All right. So along the same lines, and that's funny because, not funny, but it's, uh, to me, it's, touch, it's important because I just watched the Harriet Tubman movie last night to get more insight into this after doing this more research. Um, so she first escapes in 1849. So, and she escaped from Maryland to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So if you just think about the timeline of women just going and, and not, they're just not accepting their station in life. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. That's just the pervasive. Yeah. It's just a pervasive conversation. Right. And, and, and everybody knows Harriet Tubman. We all know, we've all heard right. about the Underground Railroad. Yeah. But she was, she lived to be 91 years old. She freed over 70 slaves. And did you know that later she was actually a spy and a trainer for the oh, Union oh. Army? No, I did not know that. South Carolina. Wow. So she was, in short, she was, she was a tough lady. She was awesome. I like it. Right? All right. And so in that same time frame, a couple of years later, you have Sojourner Truth. And again, Sojourner Truth, she delivers her just amazing speech 
ain't I a woman? And I'm just going to say it. I will not be able to do the complete, I will, I will not be able to do it justice, but I'm just going to read this so we can understand the strength and power of her words. Okay. So I need my glasses. Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. It is the first woman God ever made was, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, together women ought to be able to turn it right side up again. And now they are asking to do it and men better let them. <laughs> I love it. So as you can imagine, those words created a huge ripple across all of that movement. And that was in Ohio. Very nice. So the Civil War, um, you know, obviously the major disruption of that across the country, women are stepping in to, to you know, assist in the hospitals, as you can see here. But it also served to be a major training ground for them because they, will t they were able to learn important organizational and occupational skills right. that they could then take to their movements that would allow them to push forward their ability to get the right to vote. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So out of that, um, and, and then you get these two powerful forces, and there have been multiple books that have been written about this relationship and about the strength that you had. You had the, um, uh, Susan B. Anthony was this tall, just strong, striking woman with the alligator purse that she would go around. And she was the front, if you will, of this partnership. Whereas, and she was not married and she did not have any children. So if you go back to Elizabeth Cady Stanton was, was married with multiple children. So she had less mobility. So between the two, Elizabeth Cady did the communication and she wrote the words and Susan B. Anthony was able to go be out and be the public figure for that. So those two together formed the American Equal Rights Association in 1866. It's amazing. And then along that time, and if you, you know, think, think back about what's going on with the Civil War, the Slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, and the 14th Amendment is ratified, and basically what is saying is that it extends to all citizens protections of the Constitution against any unjust laws. Um, it defines, the thing about it though, is it still defines citizens and voters as male. Mm. So it does help for citizens that if you, if you were, if you were um, a prior slave, right. but and if you were male, but if you were female, it did not do much for you. It's not cool. No. So then we get into some things about, um, as you will, when you have larger organizations, you will see that um, sometimes people disagree and they disagree about, yeah, go ahead. A lot of these women, they look older. Were they older? Do we know their ages? Uh, they were probably in their fifties. You know, some of them were because some of them that, you know, they weren't there. There are other younger women like Ida B. Wells, but yeah, they're right. These women are, plus life was hard back well, then right you know when you're younger too you don't really have the courage to go do things you know that you might be thinking you want to do like you want to do it but you're like eh, maybe yeah not. well so, and, yeah. and if you're living in the societal norms of you're supposed to be married and have right. your children and women weren't allowed to have their own money they weren't allowed to, you know to work okay. they weren't allowed to, they were right so you were you had no station in life right um, unless you and Harry were married and, and you had a, um, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, her husband was an abolitionist. So yeah. he was the progressive as well. So no, it's good, good call out, uh, Karen. Yeah. So, but it's good to know that again, we all think of the, you know, the kumbaya kind of thing of women working together. And there was a split. There was a disagreement because you had the women that were more radical, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, excuse me, Anthony. And then you had more of the, proper tea ladies that wanted to do it in a certain way. Right. And that's kind of what happened with that. So one set went to Boston or was in Boston and one set was in New York. All right. And so in 1870, the 15th amendment passed. And so that basically um, allows for, uh, uh, for it enfranchises black men um, 
what happened with this, though, is that you have this major fraction um, between Elizabeth, excuse me, between Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. They had been cohorts, and he is this just pronounced figure. He is an orator par excellence. He has so much strength and charisma, and they had worked so strongly together. But because the women that were supporting suffrage would not get behind this because they felt it would detract, um, and they wanted to work towards the 16th Amendment, which would encompass all, it was it was really tough between the two. And 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 it's uh, I think it's one of the people will argue that the suffragists were um, racists. So it it really does paint that with um, you know to kind of not just paint it all with the rosy picture, right? You have to get into the, the, you know, the truth of it, right? And what people were really trying to get for themselves. Well, so. yeah, because usually self, you know, is more important at the time sometimes. Exactly, people exactly. Yeah. You know. And, uh, you know, Susan B. Anthony being the tough broad she was, she just decided she had none of it and that, because she also believed that with the passage of amendments that it should also grant her the ability to right. the right to vote. So she did. So she went to go cast her vote in 1872. She was promptly arrested. Um, and as you can see here, she was, and we heard about this when we went to Susan B. Anthony house, she refused to pay a single dollar of the quote unjust penalty. So, and at the same time, you can see that Sojourner Truth also went to go cast a vote in Michigan, and right. she was turned away. So they just weren't going to ask permission, right? They were just going to ask forgiveness. They were just right, going to right. plow on through. Sometimes that's what you got to do. That's right. <laughs> um, so the first suffrage amendment that was put forward to the Congress was formed in 1878. So you that's 40 years or so before the actual one was passed. It's the exact same language. Right. Mm -hmm. So think about how hard these women worked for so long. Wow. Right. Thank God they did. Oh, my gosh. It's just the tenacity. Yeah. The tenacity of it all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they just um, so the language is there and now they just have to keep plowing away. So this is where things get really interesting. OK. Um, because now the two parties of the two women's groups of suffrage they merged back together in 1890, and now they become the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or uh, the NAWSA. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have some power behind that between the editor of the Women's Journal. So you have some strength in the, in the written word. And, and I've got this really interesting um, calendar that I bought that when I was in um, Washington, D.C., that shows some really, and I know I'm kind of cutting off with my cool background up that here, but it shows all kinds of pamphlets and things that were sent out. Um, and just the, the amount of creativity that they had to use, because you got to figure they did this with telegrams and letters and newspapers and magazines. There was no television uh, you know, you might have had had to think about when the when people might have even had the ability to have phone calls, right? Like so, radio, you know, yeah. I mean, it was just the ability to get their message out um, was oh, it had just, to be immensely difficult. I, exactly, and their their organizational skills through that were astonishing to me. Astonishing. So, yeah, um, like today, where you can. Just drop a, you know, an email to 5 million people or, or text, group text. Right, right. It was a whole lot heavier lift. And yeah. then another name that she's also part of the suffrage movement, but I don't think um, a lot of folks that, um, you know, if they're, if they're thinking suffrage and they're thinking Susan B. Anthony and maybe Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, they need to know about uh, Ida B. Wells because she was a strong advocate for um, uh, you know, anti-lynching. Anti uh, and she really started that strongly after three black businessmen were lynched in Memphis in 1891. And again, she was a suffrage leader as well. So, and there's a picture of her in the Susan B. Anthony house yeah. in Rochester that we saw as well. That same photograph, actually. 
So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, again, like I said, she was the writer between she and Susan B. Anthony. Um, she did not suffer any fools when it came to putting her thoughts to paper. So she created the Women's Bible. Nice. And I, it was a little too radical for uh, the folks that were actually working on suffrage. So the NAWSA uh, decided that they would no longer allow her to be part of their group. And they kind of just pulled back from her. Uh, so you can see where she was really, she was the forefront. She was constantly pushing the envelope. She used her words like, like a sword. I mean, she just would not relent. And, you know, she's a fascinating character that I would like to learn more about. Um, and so the Women's Bible was used as, um, was used against the suffrages suffragettes uh, quite a bit as well. So um, you could argue it, you know, it might have delayed it, but I personally, um, you know, I'm just fascinated by this, the concept of what she did through this. Right. And then going back to our, the strength and power of our, 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 our African-American women, including Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, who we just mentioned, mm -hmm. in 1896, they formed um, another group called the National Association of Colored Women. So they're also forging a strength of, of you know, ties together so that they are something to be reckoned with as well. And you can just, again, you can see the labor union, you can see the abolitionists, you can see, Afri you can see the African-American women, you can see, you know, the suffragists, you can just see this, this right. growth of what is being done in our country to pull people up. And it's amazing. Nice. So here's a name not a lot of people have heard. I had not heard of her um, either until I started reading more about this. And I had this book that I was showing you mm -hmm. last time. So, uh, this book is The Women's Hour, and it is written by Elaine Weiss, and it does a full account of the summer that the, um, the 19th Amendment was actually ratified in um, Nashville, Tennessee. And Carrie Chapman Cat is an integral character. She kind of looks like Meryl Streep a little bit to me. <laughs> <laughs> she is <laughs> she is a powerhouse, and as Susan B. Anthony is getting older and not able to carry on with her duties, mm -hmm. then Carrie Chapman Cat um, becomes the the new leader of the suffrage movement. The wand. All right. Pardon me. She took the wand or the baton. She, she took the wand. Yes, and then two years later, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is um, has deceased. And her, um, her grave is there in uh, Rochester, no, excuse me, Seneca Falls, Seneca Falls. Um, so you can see just the strength and power of her and what, what she did for the movement. And again, she did not relent. Um, I, I just personally think that she, just this power that she had with her words was just absolutely astonishing to me especially the quote that she had right there. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll just read that quote. They who say that women do not desire the right of suffrage, that they prefer masculine domination to self-government, falsify every page of history, every fact in human experience that has taken the whole power of the civil and canon law to hold women in this subordinate position, which it is said she willingly accepts. Mm -hmm. Strong words. Strong words. So 17 years before, um, uh, or 16 years before, no, 17, 1920, 17 before women get the right to vote, they are, again, New York leads the forefront on a lot of this when it comes to the labor unions. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, women that started the Women's Trade Union League of New York, and you can just see um, you know, what they're doing. They also support women's suffrage. It later became known as, and we've all heard and seen of this, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Okay. And there's their emblem on the bottom right. A living wage. Mm -hmm. An eight-hour day living wage. Mm -hmm. Very nice. 
terrible it took that long to have a reasonable amount of time for work. I think that's the thing that we just, you know, for me, and I was, uh, when I'm researching this and just thinking about, you know, the treatment of, oh. of women in the workplace, in the home, the lack of the ability to own, you know, their own land, unless they're inheriting it, uh, you know, their own money. And Having it really, their husbands, you know, it, exactly I mean, it back in the day. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then the torches passed on um, because Susan B. Anthony um, passed away before uh, the right to vote. She worked on it, you know, and, and was just a determined soul. And she lived to be 86 years old, and she still did not see women get the right to vote. Yeah. So I didn't post it in here, but you probably will remember um, in the night in the 2016 election, the amount of people that went to her grave site and put okay. their I voted stickers yep. yeah, I on her that. gravestone. Mm -hmm. I remember that, absolutely. And that's in Rochester, New York. That is. It is. So it's, it's really interesting, but there is a whole group of women and men and then also industry that are deemed the antis. So they are anti-suffragists. They right. do not want them to get the right to vote. They think it will lead to the utter decline of family life within the United States. And of course, the um, if, if you kind of, you can read a little bit more about who was part of this, uh, the railroad magnets, the meat packers, uh, the liquor folks, they really thought that if women would get to write the vote, then they were going to be out on their ear. Right. So there was just this whole, um, amazing uh, infrastructure of women that were every bit as organized and, and determined that women were not going to have the right to vote and did not want it for themselves, obviously, did not want it for themselves. Mm, crazy. <laughs> I know. So this is something that, and I know you, you and I were talking a little bit about it, and it's not exactly something that... Um, is reflected as much when we think of the suffrage movement, um, when people think about the origins with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the, you know, the Women's Rights Convention, and all the work that was done in New York. Right. Um, there were two, and, and I was sharing a little bit of, of, about this with you, and how I learned about it. Um, my daughter was in a play that they wrote themselves in high school, and they used the, the whole, the play was called Don't Forget the Ladies, and they, they wrote it about these two women specifically that are part that I'm mentioning here from 1913. Mm -hmm. So Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. So they were sick and tired of suffrage taking so long that they decided that they were going to kind of uh, take the bull by the horns and look at the tactics that were being done um, in the more militant way that was being done in England. And so like Emmeline Pankhurst, and some of the uh, the women that really just took the bull by the horns. And I mean, in England, that group in England was labeled a terrorist organization. Oh, wow. So in the United States, for Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, they, they took it to a whole other level to pick at the White House. They went on hunger strikes, and they engaged in far more than in civil disobedience than what has been done thus far to really bring suffrage to light right. um, and for people to take to pay attention. So one of the ways that they did, and I don't have you ever seen this image before? Did yeah, you ever I, know? I have, I love it. Isn't it great? So they actually did this suffrage parade, and they did it that was the day before uh, Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Uh, even though it said that he was supposed to be in town, so they did it before that. Um, it, it's, you know, it said that, you know, of course, that's quite a, a sight, right, to see a woman in you know, white on this horse. There were hostile members of the crowd that were swarming, and they were insulting the women, so they weren't met with, you know, a, a ton of accolades, but they were there to get attention, and right. that's what they did, and bring it to light. All right. So Carrie Chapman Cat, she was masterful in, uh, you know, looking at what she needed to do to get things passed 
she really knew how to form a plan and work it. So in 1916, she announced a quote unquote winning plan of suffrage at a convention in Atlantic City and talked about the amount of state and local associations that she was going to incorporate to get that done. So she really just created this vision and took it to uh, task. Nice. So going back to, um, you know, the two sides kind of, you know, you've got this more militant you right. know, group over here with Lucy Burns and Alice Paul. And so in 1917, they, they were called the silent sentinels. Okay. So because they would do civil uh, disobedience and they were usually quiet, you know, they're, they're using their signs, you know, votes for women, all the different things. Well, on November uh, 14th, 1917, there was a group of them that were arrested. They were taken to the Aconquin Workhouse, which is no more, but you can actually find the, um, the stairs that lead up to it at the Belmont Paul House, which is a museum to the suffrage movement with um, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns in Washington, D.C. Okay. This is what struck me, and this is where my daughter played Lucy Burns mm -hmm. um, in a play and how I learned more about it. And this is actually a photograph of Lucy Burns. So in this, she, she's arrested, and she's handcuffed, handcuffed over her for hours. There's another uh, woman that's thrown into a cell. She hits her head. She passes out. The woman she's in the cell with has a heart attack. Um, and because they didn't go give up, right. you know, they were just brutalized. Um, there, you've probably seen the movie The Iron Jawed Angels. No, I and there's a there's a movie that's specifically about this. Okay. And one of the other things, and I didn't put this in here, but and again, this was something that I did not know. And if you'll notice, it's called the Night of Terror. Um, okay. But as the women, if they remain as they remained in jail, they they went on hunger strikes. Right. And because they went on hunger strikes, and that was bad publicity for the politicians inside the jail they decided they weren't going to let them starve to death so they force fed them with tubes through their noses oh. to the point where some of them were physically damaged the rest of their lives oh. yes i i know i never knew that did you know that i did not know that oh that's awful so again new york leads the way i gotta give it to major props to new york they yeah. woo. um they, women win the right to vote in New York um, because of the, the, the petition that's signed and they're gathered. So this is just a major celebration and a major okay. win. So, you know, they're really doing amazing things in New York. All right. Then in World War II break, or excuse me, World War I breaks out yep. and women are right there and they are stepping in. They are supporting the soldiers. They are doing jobs. They are doing all kinds of quote unquote war work. Right. Um, and some of them step back from suffrage. They don't, you know, they don't want to politicize it. Um, and then others are like, as you can see with this, right. you're doing this. Why won't you give us the right to vote? Exactly. And then in 1919, uh, it does pass that same language from 1878 that was put forward passes both the House and the Senate in a special session, and then it has to go to the states for ratification. Okay. Okay. And finally, uh, North Carolina, I'm so sorry, North Carolina did not do it. I was going to say, which states did not vote for it? The South, you, can tell, you can tell the southern states, most of the southern states did not. Okay. Um, so I, I know for sure North Carolina did not. And but Tennessee and it was iffy. And this whole right. book again, yeah, I see the, that. This whole book, The Woman's Hour. Go yeah. back to see if I can hold it to where you can see. Ah, no. ah. Okay, yeah, I know. It's like trying to get it. Trying. This book is an amazing chronicle, and it is so dramatic. It has it has you know bribery. It has you know, sex, it has all kinds of things that really, yeah. what led for this summer, the work that had to be done in stifling heat, right. women coming to Nashville, both the suffragists 
and the antis convening on Nashville in right. August. August, remember? All the clothes hot. they wear, too. Oh, my gosh. Back then, they wore so much layers. and la Oh, no, thank you. Layers. And you can see it here. And it talks about the Hermitage Hotel is the place where they stayed. So you had Carrie Chapman Cat on one floor and then the antis that were on four floors up. So they both set up headquarters in the Hermitage Hotel in that summer, both doing their work. And it was really touch and go. And, and it came down, Karen, to one vote. Wow. One vote. So when people think their vote doesn't matter, right. Clearly one vote. Right. Right? Right. One vote. What do we got? So fast forward to commemorating this you know, getting the right to vote in 1920, and, you know, you're, again, in the, in the wonderful location of Rochester, so you have, you, you can go down to the next slide, um, you have all these great things that are in place honoring that with the Susan B. Anthony House and the Susan B. Anthony Park, this beautiful statue of, of Susan B. Anthony talking to Frederick Douglass. There's just so much that you have that um, just is enriching about that. Um, and then was it about 100 miles away, you can go to the next slide, yep. in Seneca Falls, where they had the first women's rights convention. Yep. Um, yep. And that's where they have the Women's Rights National Historical Park and the center. And that's where we were able to go see. It's a wonderful exhibit there. I, I learned so much because the exhibit in this talks about, um, you know, just the journey. And you mentioned the clothing. Right, Karen, you mentioned the clothing. This, to me, what struck me is they have exhibits here of the, the contortion that women had to have with the corsets yep. and what it did to their organs and their bodies and all of that, just the, all of that. So in the 1920s, you had the, you've heard the bloomers, right? Yeah. So the, and the, the flappers and all of that. They started to cast away all of that as well. Right. And they're like, no more of this nonsense. Um, so it was just, the, the suffragists really didn't adopt that because they, they wanted to be taken as serious. As serious. But uh, you'll also notice the purple and yellow yes. flags. Mm -hmm. So that is, those are the colors that were synonymous for the women's suffrage movement. Um, and, you know, so that was, you know, what they adopted. But it's just so wonderful that they have done such an amazing job at Seneca Falls honoring that and all the locations. I just was, I was, I was back in tears just seeing how much they've done to, um, to really, like I say, pay homage to that. So it's well done. Well it was done. Very nicely done. And, and then one that you might not be aware of, but there is also, so as the headquarters and the things that were being done there in Rochester and Seneca Falls, then in Washington, D.C., you had Alice Paul and Lucy Burns and what their work was uh, with the National Women's Party. So they were in, um, it's now been dubbed the Belmont Hall House and is still in existence. And it's an old house, but it's been, it, it burned down and it's been, re, been rebuilt. Um, but they have amazing um, artwork as in that first uh, photograph that you have there. Um, I actually just put the, she was recently given that stamp of Alice Paul. Yes. Um, and then this is me on the stairs and it talks about a man in, demanding the amendment to get the right to vote and down below that's a statue of Joan of Arc. Oh. So it's, it's just so much richness. And by the way, there's also statues with Carrie Chapman cat and some other suffragettes um, in Nashville. And they're also going to be unveiling uh, another statue in central park, New York, for the women suffragists um, coming for this 20th of I mean, this 100th year anniversary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Um, yes. Just in case you haven't seen the Schoolhouse Rock, Suffering Suffragists, you got to find, you got to read that because that to me, I went from knowing that much about suffrage from what I learned in Schoolhouse Rock. Right. Exactly. Literally, right. To okay. knowing all of this and learning all this. And I am a woman in my 50s. I'm and then this, just the strength and the power of the women and the organization and and not only that, but the, the men that were their husbands, their fathers, their brothers that supported them, the yeah. lawmakers that did the work, 
Um, because, we, of course, women were not elected to office, so it's all men making these right. decisions, right? Um, so it was just phenomenal, the journey, and now we have to um, just honor our right to vote and use it. Very nice. Right. I mean, it's just it's silly for us to uh, not take advantage of our right to vote because without our you know, opinion of what we want, how are we really going to be able to even fight? Well, I didn't, you know, I didn't vote for this person. So why are you complaining? You know what I mean? If you're not going to go vote, you can't, you shouldn't complain. Right. Exactly. So to, so to be represented, you got to vote. Go that's right. Vote. That's because right. And suffered for us. And, and, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, for people to just take to take to heart that this was not something that was given to you to right. have the right to vote people literally gave their lives to this right. effort people you know they died before they saw it come to fruition they suffered yeah. immensely and they they did not relent um so they that, give us the right so without them doing all those things we would have never gotten it that's exactly right so again, I'm grateful that you and I had the chance to, yeah. oh, if you scroll down, I think there's a couple of pictures of us maybe, or is oh. that it? I think that's it. That's um, all right. Yeah. So, that you know, that you and I saw those things together and we were able to go explore Rochester and see those images. And um, I was just so grateful for that. It was definitely, I, I was very thankful that you had interest in going because I learned so much. And it was quite exciting to know what they had done for us. I, it, it really, it spoke to me on just a cellular level um, on, on that. And, you know, the celebration that they had to feel and what they just, again, what they had to work towards and, you know, and the, the fact that they fought against so many societal oh. uh, confines, right? Um, it's just, I, their strength and their courage is just. And uh, determination. I mean, they didn't right. give up, you know, and that's with anything you can't, you can't give up. You got to keep trying. If it's something that you truly believe in and feel that it's right, you got to go. You got to keep going. No matter that's how right. much you fall or hit a brick wall or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm wearing the pin that I bought when we were up there. Let's see, I'll show if, if I can take it off and show you. I don't know if you can see it from here, but it says um, organize, agitate, and educate must be our war cry. And that is Susan, that's the Susan B. Anthony quote. That's right. Squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? That's agitate. right. Agitate them. That's it. <laughs> oh, here they come again. No. Here they come again. <laughs> yeah, she, you know, Susan B. Anthony, you know, was a tall, slender, powerhouse of a woman like I said and can you just imagine just being in that time when you know you are having having those conversations and the things and the vision that you had to do which just was antithetical to everything that was expected right right and the thing that gets me is how it all really started with women one woman inviting four other women over, <laughs> having a conversation, honest conversation about what was happening in their lives to where they decided to organize. Quickly. That, yeah. Go ahead. Quickly. They were very fast about it. Oh, I know. 10 days. <laughs> 10 days. I, I had to go back and reread again. I went, what? Wait a minute. They did all that in 10 days? I mean, that seems very acceptable to our times now. Oh, 10 days, no problem. But even that would still be a big event to plan in 10 days. Yes, and yes. Planning and, and achieving it back then. I know. And, you know, what I loved when you and I went to Seneca Falls, one of the things that I really loved about that was the reenactment that they had of the actress. Yes, she was very good. She was so good. And so she was really just in embodying Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her words and she's wearing the dress and you know it's just this pretty empty building with just what like almost like pews right you're just sitting on the you know the wooden slats basically and you know it's just this cavernous building 
Um, and I can't imagine it was summer, of course, summer in July, oh, yeah. July and New York's not quite as hot as, you know, Nashville, but well, it can get pretty hot here and humid too. I was surprised how humid it was compared to Charlotte. I was like, oh darn, you guys are almost just as humid. Mm -hmm. I don't like humid. <laughs> but when, when we get through, uh, so when you and I went to go see those things that I was so determined to see those places in my life. And now that we're under this, you know, yeah. this sequestering, um, but once people, if they're, if they're really wanting to learn more about that um, and go see some of these things, like I said, uh, you know, the Susan B. Anthony House in Rochester, excuse me, so I'm telling them to go away. Um, the Seneca Falls has the women's rights um, hall that we just saw. And you can see where, and then right next to it is the actual building where they had the very first convention. Right. So that's where we went to. Um, and it's a beautiful spot anyway. It's just right. so picturesque and, you know, uh, it's just so gorgeous. And then you have, it, like I was talking about in Washington, D.C., the Belmont Paul House. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's it's not very, very it's not very large, but that you can see where they, it was their actual headquarters, just like the Susan B. Anthony House. Um, and one of the things I loved about that is, the photographs that were taken during that time. Yes. And I, I was there with several people because I was in Washington, D.C. for another event. And there was a young family there. This was last August. And there was a two little girls with mom and dad. And the little girls are maybe eh, seven and six, seven and five. And their names were Lucy and Alice. Yes. So it was so cool because their parents had continued on to, you know, not let their daughters not know that. So I would just say that um, go see these places. Go go pay homage to these women. Yeah, take your daughters. Take your mothers. Yes. Take and all the women, if, men. Take the men. Take the boys. Take your right. sons. And 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 understand that. In the 1800s, I'll just give you this image for a second. In the 1800s in England, when women did not, you know, we, women had no power whatsoever. If a wife talked too much, she had a metal cage put over her head. Do you know how long I would have been wearing one of those? Right? And, oh, no. and, and just so the, the courage and the tenacity and just all the things that women had to endure. Oh, so I can't even imagine because, yeah. you know, we have so many more rights now that we didn't have them and things, bad things happen to women still. So I yes. can't even imagine what it would have been like back then. Yes. Oh, so fine. we owe them a lot of gratitude and to, and to um, the women that continue fighting the fight. So, um, you know, like to me, I think of people like Stacey Abrams, he was continuing on for, for voting rights. Right. Um, so I think we just really, you know, um, have to appreciate that the right to vote is our voice and we have to use it. Yes, we do. Now more than ever. That's it. <laughs> That's it. But I thank you, my friend. It's so well, good to see you. you. Thank you for educating us a little bit more on uh, our rights as women and the suffrage movement. And thank you for coming to Rochester and, Help yes. us, taking me around to my own area that I didn't even know these things were there. Um, so I definitely appreciate it. I am so glad we had an opportunity to do that. And I can't wait to get back up to upstate New York once oh, all this yeah. is over and, and see you and see all those places. And um, go again. yeah, do a 2.0. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. You be good. And I will talk Thank to you. you soon. All right. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Yes. No man is greater than his mother No man is half so good No man is better than the wife he loves Her love will guide him whatever betide him She's good enough to love you and adore you She's good enough to bear your troubles for you And if your tears were falling today Nobody else would kiss them away She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses When you are lonesome and blue She's good enough to be your baby's mother
mother And she's good enough to vote with you. <laughs>